So I've got this oscilloscope hooked up to this cheap USB keyboard capturing and decoding the data packets from it. And we're getting these eight byte data packets that describe what keys are being pressed. The first byte is encoding the uh, modifier keys, control shift, all that sort of thing. And then the second byte is actually not used, which leaves six bytes remaining for any other keys that happen to be pressed. Um, and that it, you know is a limitation. It, it can only report up to six simultaneous key presses. And that limitation of only being able to report six simultaneous key presses is called six key rollover. And that's actually pretty standard for communication with USB keyboards. Though in a previous video, I walked through the entire plug and play negotiation with this particular keyboard. And we saw that during that negotiation, it described the format of this uh, data packet. And, and you could see here it's saying that it's reporting six keys. So at least in theory, it seems like it would be possible for a keyboard to potentially report more than six simultaneous keys being pressed. But even so, this particular keyboard actually isn't even a six key rollover keyboard. Um, look, for example, if I press O, you'll see you know, the key code for O is 12, that shows up there. If I then also press P, you'll see 12 and 13 for both of those. But now look what happens if I try to also simultaneously press L. All of a sudden, I don't get the 12 and 13 anymore, I get all ones, and that's just indicating an error condition. The keyboard uh, doesn't know what to do <laughs> with me pressing these three keys, L, O, and P. So at least for those three keys, the keyboard was only going to register two of them at the same time. So this keyboard is actually only a two key rollover keyboard. And what's going on with that has to do with how the keyboard is wired internally. Because internally, there's this matrix um, that define each key. So there's sort of, uh, you know, rows and columns. And the keyboard is, in trying to figure out which keys are being pressed, it's going to kind of scan along each column and, and each row. So what it'll do is it'll put, you know, some current, for example, into column one here, and it'll see which rows it comes out. So for example, if we're pressing this key right here, the keyboard's gonna scan, it's gonna put some current into row one. Well, none of these keys are being pressed, so that current's not gonna come out any of these rows here. So then it's gonna move on, it's gonna put some current into row two and it's not gonna come out A, but it is gonna come out B. So we put current into, into two, it's gonna come out B. So the keyboard's gonna notice like, okay, so two B, uh, that key there must be pressed, um, but nothing coming out to C, this is not connected. So then it moves on to three, nothing at three A, three B, three C, moves on to four, and it keeps scanning like that. And the keyboard is just gonna continually scan um, the rows and columns like that, you know, many, many times per second. So as soon as you press a key, it's able to detect that. So in this case, when we're pressing you know, that, that key that's located at that 2B position, it's able to detect that. Now let's say we happen to press two keys at the same time. Well, that also works, right? Because if we put current into column one here, it's not gonna come out A, B, or C. But if we put current into column two, it is gonna come out uh, row B. So we, we're, we're again detecting that key 2B is, is pressed because that current is gonna flow that way. And then when it scans over to column three, uh, it's gonna see the currents, it's not gonna come out A or B, but it is gonna come out C. So it's gonna detect that 2C is also pressed, or excuse me, 3C, that 3C is pressed. And then it's gonna move on to four, and that's not connected to anything, it's not pressing any of those keys. And so in this case, the keyboard is gonna properly detect that 2B and 3C are the two keys that are being pressed. But now what happens if we press a third key? So at this point, it's gonna do the same thing. It's gonna scan across. So it's gonna say, okay, if I put some current into, uh, into column one here, that doesn't come out A, B, or C. If I put some current into column two here, well, it's gonna come out B, as you would expect. So two B uh, must be pressed. Um, but that current is also going to flow, you know, because this is connected here, and this is connected. It's also gonna <laughs> flow down here because this is connected to C. So it's gonna say, oh, well, two C is also pressed, which, of course, you can see 2C is not pressed, but because these three points are connected, we're pressing those three keys, it's gonna falsely detect that 2C must be pressed as well. And then it's gonna keep scanning, so three, it's gonna put some current in there, it's gonna see that three is connected to B, so 3B. It's gonna also see that three is connected to C, so 3C. Um, and then it's gonna move on to four. Four is not connected to A, B, or C, so it doesn't detect any of that. So in this case, we're pressing these three keys but the scanning algorithm uh, and, the, and just the way that this hardware is set up detects that we're pressing 2B, 2C, 3B, and 3C. So it actually thinks we're pressing this fourth key over here that we're not pressing. And this is a phenomenon that is referred to as ghosting. And what will happen with a keyboard that is set up like this is that the keyboard is going to have you know, some little bit of intelligence to detect that this might be going on. 
So if the keyboard detects that you know, these four keys are pressed, the keyboard's smart enough to know that, well, if I detect that those four keys are pressed, I really don't know if it's actually those four keys or if it's maybe three of them. And then if it's three of them, I don't know which three. Um, so then the keyboard's gonna say, nope, that's an error. And that's where we would see it report that error like this, where it just sort of, essentially when we press that third key, it kind of throws up its hands and says, nope, I don't, I don't really know what you're doing. So I'm just gonna report an error. That way the computer doesn't you know, register a key press that you didn't actually press. It just doesn't register a key press that you did press, which I guess is sort of in that situation, the, the better scenario. So how do you work around this? Well, the way to work around it is that when you press a key, rather than simply connecting those two uh, parts of the matrix, what it would do is put a diode into the circuit like that. So the key, every key is actually associated with a diode. Um, so in this case, Again, if you're putting current into column two, it's gonna flow through this diode and come out uh, row B over here. So two B, no problem detecting that. And same thing here, if we press uh, this key down here as well, and pressing that key adds a diode to that circuit there, then you know putting current in two, it's only gonna come out B, no problem. So we detect two B is pressed. Putting current into three here, that's gonna flow through this diode. It's gonna come out C. And so we're gonna detect that 2C is also pressed. But then in that scenario where we press the third key, if that also essentially just adds a diode to the circuit like that, well, we can scan that as well, right? Because you know obviously one is not connected to anything. When we put current into, into row two here, it's gonna flow through this diode in one direction, come out B, so we detect that 2B is pressed. But once it's on this, uh, this B row, it's not gonna flow backwards through this diode because that's what a diode does. A diode only allows current to flow one way. So that's it. Uh, current goes in two, it comes out B, that's it. So that's gonna move on to, to column three here. And so when it puts current into column three, that's gonna flow through this diode and come out row B, no problem there. So it's gonna detect that three B is being pressed. And it's also gonna go through this diode and come out row C. So it's gonna detect that three C is also pressed. And that's it, because the current can't flow backwards through any of these diodes, we're not gonna get that ghosting situation. So if it's as simple as just adding diodes like this to each of the keys, you know, why don't, uh, you know, why, why wouldn't this keyboard do that? And the answer honestly is that, well, diodes cost money. Um, and even though they're maybe only a half a cent each with about a hundred keys on this keyboard, that's, you know, 50 cents <laughs> added cost to producing this keyboard. and uh, you know, the manufacturer just said, no, nah, not worth it. But I've got a different keyboard here that does support N key rollover. And so I'm curious to see how it works. And one thing that's kind of interesting here is on the back of this keyboard, it says that you can actually turn N key rollover on or off. So if you press shift and then the mute button, um, there's, I guess there's an LED that'll blink once if N key rollover is turned on and then twice if it's turned off. So it'll be interesting to see what that does exactly. If you press shift and then I guess this button here, it'll turn it on and off. Let's take a look at how this works. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't look like I'm able to capture the data coming out of this keyboard because when I uh, first plug it in like this, what happens is it goes through the normal negotiation where uh, D minus is low and D plus is high, and that signals that this is gonna be a full speed um, communication. But then as soon as it starts communicating, it, you get this kind of weird um, lower voltage oscillation here. And what's going on with that is that one of the things that a full speed device can do is that it can um, go through this high speed handshake and actually um, bump the speed up to, to high speed. So, so low speed is 1.5 megabits per second, full speed is 12 megabits per second, and we've been able to capture that just fine here. But then high speed is 480 megabits per, per second. That's quite a bit faster and sort of out of the range of what this oscilloscope can capture. And so that's what's happening here is it's going through this, um, this chirp process uh, so, you know, it talks about an alternating sequence of chirp K and chirp J. And if you look at the voltage specs here, uh, chirp J and chirp K levels are this, you know, 700 to 1100 millivolts or negative 900 to negative 500 millivolts. And so that's sort of what's going on here is it's oscillating between those lower voltage to signal that it wants to operate at high speed. And it seems kind of strange that a keyboard would need to operate at 480 megabits per second. You'd think 12 megabits per second would be more than enough. Uh, but what is really happening here is this keyboard is more than just a keyboard. It's got a USB hub in here. And in fact, it's a USB 3 hub, um, although it is operating at USB 2 because I'm plugging it into a USB 2 port on the computer. But even still, it's gonna try to negotiate as fast as it can, up to 480 megabits per second for USB 2. 
so that if I plugged any devices into the hub ports on this keyboard, they would be able to operate at, at high speed. And so really this keyboard is more than just a keyboard, it's a keyboard and a USB hub. And so actually if we do a LS USB T to see sort of a tree view of the USB devices, you can see the keyboard here is actually operating at 12 megabits per second. So the keyboard itself is full speed, but then what this is showing is it's showing that the keyboard is plugged into a USB 2 hub that's operating at 480 megabits per second. And then that of course is plugged into the, the computer. And it's kind of interesting here, it says it's plugged into a USB 3 bus, but the, the actual physical port on the computer is 2.0, which is why it's negotiating it at 2.0 here. But in any event, what, what we're seeing here is we're seeing that the hub is, is what's operating at 480 megabits per second. The keyboard, if we could somehow uh, intercept this connection between the keyboard and the hub, the keyboard's actually talking at 12 megabits per second. Unfortunately though, the only external connection here is the, the one cable coming out of the keyboard, which is the really the cable for the hub. But what we could do is take the keyboard apart and see if maybe, just, just maybe, there might be somewhere inside the keyboard where we can find those two sort of um, logical components are connected. So let me go ahead and pull a bunch of screws out of this and see if we can open this up and, and see what we get. All right, so this is interesting. We've got a little circuit board here. Let's see, there we go. We can kind of sort of attached here. Let's see if I can detach this. There we go. So that's kind of coming apart. Get these screws out of the way. And we've got a little circuit board here and this looks like it's probably the circuit board for the USB hub at least because you've got the you know cable coming in from the computer and you've got your USB ports here. What I was hoping to see is I was hoping to see a connection in here that looked more like a, you know, sort of a USB 2 connection. We have this little ribbon cable that goes into the keyboard, but just looking at this, it's got way more connectors on it than you would need for just a standard uh, full speed USB 2 connection. So I'm guessing that whatever protocol is, is going across this cable, it's not USB 2. But let me pull this board out and take a closer look. Maybe we can uh, learn some more. Oh, one more screw here. There we go. Does this come off? Yes. So that's the circuit board. And it's kind of interesting <laughs> that it, it actually uses, this looks like just a standard uh, USB 3 connector. They've just kind of got it hot glued on there. It's kind of interesting. And then there's this ribbon cable that goes to the keyboard. Let me disconnect that just to get a, a better look at the board. And let me kind of pull some of this other stuff out of the way here. And here we can get a better look at it. And what, I, what I'm noticing is there's a couple, actually there's really two big chips. There's one here, it's got lots of pins. And then there's one over here kind of underneath actually get this knob out of the way. There's this other chip here that's got a bunch of pins. And that kind of makes sense. I would expect there to be two, I mean, there's sort of two functions on here we're, we're expecting. We're expecting a USB hub um, as well as whatever's driving the keyboard. So let's take a closer look at what, what these chips are. So we've got one chip here on the front, which um, says it's a VL812-Q7. So VL812-Q7 is a super speed USB 3.0 hub controller. So that makes sense. So that's <laughs> our solution, your success. All right, so this, I mean, that looks like the chip and they're showing it here in an application where it's a USB 3 hub. So presumably that chip is driving the hub and here's a little block diagram of it. So it looks like it's got a port zero coming in here and then it gives you four ports uh, going out and these are USB 3 so you've got in addition to the D plus and D minus pins that you have for USB 2 You've also got this TX plus TX minus RX plus RX minus um, so that's a USB 3 thing So that's this chip right here and then we've got another chip over on the other side and that looks like a Nuvotan NUC 123 SD4 BNC it's more of an eye test than anything And let's see what that is. Okay, here we are. It looks like a microcontroller unit, 32-bit, 64K of flash. Um, so this looks like a microcontroller of some sort, which is kind of what I'd expect. So we've got one chip that is a USB hub controller and the other that's just a microcontroller that presumably is programmed with, by the manufacturer with keyboard functionality. So this chip's controlling the keyboard and then this chip is running the uh, USB hub. And if we actually look at the traces here, that kind of makes sense, right? Because we've got this chip here that's our uh, USB hub controller. And you can see all the traces going off to the USB ports here. We've got these two USB ports and we would expect to see um, actually three pairs because these are USB three. So there's the D plus D minus and then the uh, TX plus and minus and RX plus and minus for, for one port. And then there's 
those same three for the next port. So that makes sense. Um, and then you see, uh, it looks like the same thing coming in. So this is the input, you know, where we where you plug it into the computer. And those are exposed here. And you can see there's all these traces that are coming around uh, going into this hub chip. So you've got coming in from the computer into the hub chip, and then you've got those two ports there. Now, what we're looking for is if we want to intercept that just sort of USB 2 connection from this hub chip to the chip that's, that's operating the keyboard, we should be able to find, hopefully, um, somewhere in here, the traces that go from this to this. And so what it looks like is you can actually see there's four pairs of traces coming out here and going down um, over to the input here. But really, I would expect only three of those to actually go to that input. Um, and it looks like you've got this, this uh, sort of turn it this way, this bottom trace here goes down. That goes underneath. So let's see where that goes. That comes out here, and it looks like that does go to the input. Okay, so that's one of them. This next one, this next pair comes down, and that appears again to go to that input. And then this third set here also comes down and that goes, looks like through these two capacitors, so sort of capacitive coupling there. And that also appears to go to this input. So those are those would be the three pairs that go to the input. So maybe this, this fourth pair, let's see where that goes. That comes around and then that goes under the board and pops out right here. And that appears to go through these two resistors and into the microcontroller for the keyboard. So that would be my guess as to where uh, the connection between the keyboard and this USB hub controller is. And in fact, as a way to confirm that, we can look at the actual pin that's the, the two pins that it's using here. And it looks like it's the um, not the rightmost two, but the, the next pair in, those, those two pins there to the right um, with the sort of orientation dot in the lower left corner here. So if we look at the pinout for this with orientation dot in the lower left corner and look at what those two pins are. Let's take a look at that on the data sheet. Let's see, this doesn't have pin numbers. I think I sounded data data sheet. Here we go, data sheet. Here we go, here's a pinout. Um, so the orientation dot here in the lower left and we're looking at these two pins here and I believe that's USB P4, so port four uh, plus and minus. So that, that makes a lot of sense. So we've got the USB zero, so the input uh, plus and minus, and then the RX and TX plus and minus over here. So those are the three traces we saw, or the three pairs of traces we saw going in from the, the input. And then this over here is port four. And then over here, we've got ports one and two, and those are the ones going out to these two ports here. So that all makes a lot of sense that, that, that this pair on the left here would be the USB two connection from the hub for the keyboard. And so again, if we follow those traces, they come down here uh, to these two little vias, which go over to the other side of the board. And then if we follow that over to the other side of the board, they pop out here and they appear to go through these two resistors and into this uh, microcontroller for the keyboard. And I'm guessing these resistors are just for some impedance matching or something like that. But what we can do is we can actually try to solder on some wires to these two, uh, basically to these two connections here that we can then use to hook the oscilloscope up to, to try to see if we can tap into and monitor this USB link. So I don't think it matters too much which side of these resistors we uh, solder onto here, since there's, I wouldn't imagine there's too much current flowing through here, so the voltage drop across the resistor isn't going to be all that significant. So I'll start by adding a little uh, solder here onto these resistors. And that should be enough to just tack these wires on. Let me go this way. Let's see if I can get this to stick. Might need a little flux to help this out. Yeah, this is not the greatest connection. And the secret to good solder connection is lots of flux. So let me see if I can improve this here. And basically what flux does is it just cleans uh, any oxidation or anything off of the wire contacts or whatever. 
so that the solder is more likely to stick to it. And it really does work wonders. That looks a lot better, and then I can clean up some of that flux here with some alcohol. But that looks pretty good, and it seems strong enough. But it appears to be attached and uh, not shorting anything. That's the most important part. All right, so let's reassemble this and see if we can uh, hook the oscilloscope up and capture anything interesting on those on those wires we just attached. So I'll start by hooking the keyboard back up through this ribbon cable. I believe it goes like that, and then this goes back down like that, something like that. Um, but I won't get it all screwed together just yet in case we didn't do something right. Let's hook the oscilloscope up. So I'm going to use this little ground thing for the grounds. And then let's see, hook up each of these channels like that. And I guess we'll just kind of leave things hanging like that. Seems okay. And then I'll go ahead and plug the uh, USB in. And the keyboard blinked. And it does look like it's hooked to the computer. And let's see if we're capturing anything. Let's just trigger... Where are we here? <laughs> trigger on just an edge. Okay, so we're getting something. And it looks like it might be USB, maybe. I don't know, let's see here. Serial, USB, ah, it's gonna be full speed. Oh, and look at that, we're decoding some stuff. And now let's trigger on USB. And yeah, data, are we getting a data packet? Are we getting a data packet? We are getting a data packet, I think. It says we're getting a data packet. Boy, that's really noisy, but I guess this is not the world's greatest connection. <laughs> But yeah, that's a data packet, all right. And it actually looks to be working. So if I press, well, let's try that uh, L, O, and P again. So L, or O is 12, P is 13, and L is F. So we're actually getting those three characters. That's better than the other keyboard. And in theory, we should be able to get up to six. And if I press anything else, it looks like that's not included. But we haven't turned on the... Uh, the N key rollover mode, which we have to press, uh, was it this button and shift? Let's try that. So shift and where'd that button go? Right here. Press that button. Oh, something happened. Still getting data. That still looks like six characters. Did I do that right? Let's see. So I press shift. And this button, one blink. There we go, that's different. We're getting a bigger data packet. Interesting. So we're getting a bigger data packet. Let's see if I can see how big it is. There it is, is that the whole thing? That is the whole thing. So now let's see if I do, so that's, that looks like a very different format. Oh, interesting. So if I'm pressing semicolon, you see it's changing that to an eight. But if I press A, I get a one. Is it each? Yeah, it looks like each, yeah, each key is a bit. How about that? So if I press A, I get a one. If I press D, I get an eight, and if I press A and D, I should get a nine, because it's setting both of those bits. Yeah, so A is it, okay, A is one, B is two, C is four, D is eight, so E would be one zero. Uh, okay. Well, I don't know exactly what the, <laughs> what the format here is, but it does look like each key is setting a different bit, and so you can press as many keys as you want, and it'll just set each of the bits for each of the keys you're pressing. So that looks like that's how this particular keyboard is doing the N key rollover, which makes perfect sense. It can, you could press all 104, or however many keys there are on here simultaneously, and it would just set all of the, the bits. And uh, yeah, that would, that would work for N key rollover. So just playing with this, it looks like the first byte is for the modifier keys, the second, and then from the second on, it's just a bitmap 
of of whatever keys you're pressing. And each bit in there refers to one key, and then whatever keys you press, it sets those bits. And then I guess you can switch it between end key rollover like this uh, versus if I press shift and this button here, that just shifts it back to this normal mode that we're kind of used to seeing where we get six key rollover. And I guess that would be if your computer only supports this format um, and it is not able to negotiate to the other format. But if it is, then you press shift and looks like it doesn't there it goes. It takes a couple tries, it seems like. Interesting. But then you can switch to this end key rollover mode and press as many keys as you want. So that's pretty cool. So now I'm interested to see what it does when it uh, switches between those two modes. So let's go ahead and trigger on uh, let's see, setup packets because I'm guessing it's going to just do a setup packet. Um, so let's change this mode here. Yep, and there's some setup packets. And we're probably going to get a bunch of setup packets. So let me do the segmented capture. Turn that on. And see if we get a bunch of se segments. There we go, 25 segments. <laughs> Another 25, so I'll just sort of switch back and forth until we fill up our segment memory. There we go. And we've got all these segments. So let me go ahead and try to save all this. I'll go take a look at this. Okay, so I've gone ahead and decoded the entire conversation when it's being switched into six key rollover mode or N key rollover mode, just like I did in the previous video I made on USB human interface devices. And the first thing I noticed is that when you switch it from one mode to the other, basically the conversation that takes place makes it look to the computer as if you have unplugged one keyboard and plugged in a completely different keyboard. It, it starts the conversation over from square one. And in fact, the first thing it does is it sets the USB address. And in one case, it's setting it to 09. In the other case, it's setting it to 19. And this is just an arbitrary, uh, sort of randomly assigned thing that the computer is just giving it an address. So the fact that it's different means that from the computer standpoint, this is a different device that's just been plugged in. But otherwise, the negotiation starts out the same. So there's, it's getting the device descriptor, the vendor and product ID are the same. It's the same product. I mean, it's the same keyboard, obviously, still plugged in. It's just reinitializing itself um, a little bit differently. And so it gets the manufacturer description, gets the product description, and then it goes and gets the, the configuration descriptor. And all of that's the same. Where we start to see differences is in the configuration descriptor, although the configuration descriptor is also quite similar. One thing I noticed, though, that's different from that simpler keyboard is that it says that there's two interfaces supported by, by this configuration. And it says that whether it's coming up in the six key rollover mode or the n key rollover mode. And at first I thought that the two interfaces might refer to six key rollover versus n key rollover, but that's actually it turns out not to be true. The first thing you see here, this first, you basically see an interface descriptor, HID descriptor, and endpoint descriptor, followed by the second interface descriptor, HID descriptor, and endpoint descriptor. And that's true in, in both cases. So that, that's the two interfaces, but really the only thing that's changing as it turns out is the first interface. And at this point, really, the only thing that you can see that's different is the descriptor length. So in this case, it's 3F. In this case, it's 3.5. And this HID descriptor, of course, is the thing that's describing the data format for the, the keys that are being pressed. So that I would expect that to be different. And, and so here we are seeing that it is going to be a different length. So that makes sense. But everything else here is the same in both cases. So we've got this the first interface, and then the second interface is the same as well. You can see in both cases, the length is 8.3. So if I look at the, for the six key rollover, that length is also 8.3. So that's actually the same. Um, and then as far as what the difference is between the first interface and the second interface, we can look at a description. So in either case, it's described in, the first interface is described in string three, the second interface is described in string four, and that's true in both cases. And if we look at um, the next thing it does, is it gets those strings. And so all of this is identical. And in both cases, the string it gets for the first interface is keyboard, and for the second interface is system control. And so what's different here from that simpler keyboard is it only had one interface. And so in this case, we still have a keyboard interface, but now we've got this system control interface, which is new. Um, and so that just seems to be something that this fancier keyboard supports that's, that's different. So that suggests that it's maybe a little bit more than just a keyboard. But in either case, everything else is basically the same until we get to that actual descriptor. And so this descriptor here is describing the uh, data format for the uh, key presses and such. 
And it looks very similar to the, the, the descriptor that we saw on that cheaper keyboard in the, in the previous video that I made. And it looks very similar to the descriptor for the simpler keyboard um, that, that only supports six key rollover because this is only supporting six key rollover. And this is actually a fairly standard format where basically what you get is you get um, eight one bit reports. And these are the, the eight modifier keys, control shift alt and windows key on both sides. And then you get eight one bit reports that are constant. So this is just sort of that unused byte. And then you have this section here that's talking about the uh, LEDs. So this is for input. Well, I guess output from the, from the uh, computer standpoint. And so this is all you know, for the LEDs. And then you get to this point here where we have six eight bit reports for the six keys that are being simultaneously pressed. And then that's it. And so this is in the six key rollover mode. It gives you this. And this is the same thing that we saw on, the, on that simpler keyboard. But when you switch it to N key rollover, at this phase in the setup, it gives you a totally different descriptor here. And actually starts out the same because the first eight bits are the same modifier key. So it's still going from E0 to E7, and it's eight one-bit reports. So that first byte is the same. It's still the modifier keys. But then we go on to something else that is um, actually in a very similar format to this. So we're actually still set up for one-bit reports, but now we're saying uh, we're going from zero to 67 or six, seven hex. And there's a total of six, eight reports. And so that zero to six, seven refers to the, the key codes. So, you know, zero is, well, I guess it's reserved. One is errors and such, but eventually you get into, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight. These are actual keys on, on the keyboard. And this table just goes through all of those keys. And this is saying that we're basically going to encode all of the keys up to uh, six, seven is the maximum. So we go all the way up to six, seven, which is the equals uh, key on the keypad. Um, and then if you look after that, it's F13. It's, it's keys that a normal keyboard doesn't have. Um, but everything before that is, is just kind of your, uh, your standard keys that you would expect to find on a keyboard. So basically what this descriptor is saying is it's saying all those standard keys, we're going to map those. Uh, each report is one bit. So each of those is being mapped to one bit. And there's going to be uh, hex 68 reports. And 68 hex is, uh, well, it's pretty close to 100. So it, it, that covers pretty much all the keys other than the, the modifier keys that we've already got here. Um, and it says those are, all, those are all variable inputs. And at the end here, we have um, what amounts to the same LED uh, thing here. So it's, you know, uh, there's five bits that are associated with LEDs and then three bits of padding here, same thing, five bits associated with LEDs, three bits of padding. And so this is really the only difference, um, the really substantial difference in the negotiation between when we're setting it in six key rollover mode versus N key rollover mode. And really it's just des describing that format that we just saw in the oscilloscope. And then if we move on, I mean, basically the rest of this is all the same regardless of which mode we're in, but it is a little bit interesting what it does. Because in either case, it's defining this interface one, which is just a separate interface that has totally different stuff. It's the usage is not keyboard anymore. It's system control. It's a totally different thing. It's defined by the USB HID spec, and it has some interesting things in here. So here, it's there's a uh, you know a few bits that are that are basically set up for these different functions that are defined in the spec for system power down, system sleep, system wake up, and this actually makes sense because there's a key on the keyboard that allows you to put your computer to sleep, and so this is the this is how that works. And so you can see it's got these three bits that are defined for that. Um, then there's five bits of padding here. Um, and then this is kind of interesting. There's a, this usage page FF00, which is the first page in kind of a range that's defined for uh, just reserved for vendor defined stuff. So no idea what this is. It's just defined by the vendor. So it could be anything. Um, I really have no idea what it, what it is. But then we get into this other interesting thing, which is usage page uh, C, which is the, what the USB spec calls the consumer page. And there's all sorts of weird and interesting things uh, defined in this consumer page for, uh, I guess, controlling consumer electronics seems to be the, the use case. But in any event, if we look at what's there, and again, it's, it's the same regardless of which mode the keyboard's in, it basically just assigns um, a bit, it's either zero or one, to a whole bunch of these just sort of random things that are defined in that consumer electronics spec. And some of these do correspond to some special keys that are on the keyboard. So there's like a play pause, there's a mute button, there's a next track, previous track, these are buttons on the keyboard, and I, I guess the way they work is they they send data reports through this other you know consumer page uh, type type report. Although what's interesting is that the keyboard is 
defining all of these other functions that it apparently claims to have. So in addition to the next track, previous track, uh, play, pause, mute, and volume um, that, you know, as far as I can tell, the keyboard does support because there's actual buttons on it <laughs> to do those things. It's got things like bass boost and loudness and bass and treble increment, decrement. Um, there's apparently it could support a key to open your email program or calculator or browser. There's you know, browser forward and back and home and refresh keys. My assumption is that the, this particular keyboard manufacturer has other products that support these functions. Uh, and so the chip on the keyboard is designed to support all these things, even if the keyboard doesn't physically have those buttons. Um, so that's my guess. Or maybe there's some hidden key that I'm just unaware of on this keyboard. But anyway, I just thought that was interesting that the keyboard seems to support that. And anyway, uh, at that point, it turns all the LEDs off, and that's that's the end of the initialization. And I've actually noticed if you push these uh, other buttons here, you'll see um, it looks like there's occasionally like a four-byte thing. It's actually easiest to notice if we turn the volume knob here. So if we turn that volume knob, you see that four-byte report that shows up there that seems to include that that second interface. In fact, I bet if we zoom in here, let's see. Yeah, you can see this is interface one. We press keys, but this other stuff, there we go. You can see it's switching to interface two to report that other stuff. Um, so anyway, uh, hopefully you found this uh, interesting. I, I thought it was kind of interesting to see. I'd heard that N key rollover, I guess one way that keyboards implemented it because, I don't know, supposedly there was this limitation that you could only have six simultaneous keys that some keyboards would actually emulate multiple keyboards uh, so that you get six keys per, you know, quote unquote, emulated keyboard. But it's interesting to see that, that no, you don't need to do that. You can just extend the protocol like this and you get full end key rollover because you've got a bit for every key on the keyboard and you can just set whatever bits are currently pressed. And it works, it works really well. So yeah, hopefully you found that interesting. And as always, thanks to all my patrons who help make these videos possible. If you want to see more, check out eater.net for more videos and projects. And I guess now I've got this wacky keyboard with these wires hanging out of it.